And this is a biology session uh, for the Carlin Cymru revision sessions. It is on homeostasis and temperature regulation. Should you have any questions today, uh, please don't hesitate to um, message in the comment box. OK, we'll be able to answer you back. This is my session today. My name is Mrs. Cedar and we I come from Bishop Headley High School. OK, so let's get started today. OK, so the first thing that we're going to look at today is homeostasis. Then we're going to look at what negative feedback is. This is more of a higher tier focus. Um, so we're going to look at what negative feedback actually means. And we're going to look at the definition and how we can link that to temperature regulation today. When we look at temperature regulation, one of the things that we focus on is a cross section through the skin. So one of the things that you have to be able to do is you have to be able to label a cross section through the skin and you have to know what each of the different parts does in terms of how the body responds to an increase in temperature and how the body responds to a decrease in temperature. So let's get started. First thing that we're going to look at is what homeostasis is. Homeostasis is the regulation of the internal conditions of a cell or organism. Now, homeostasis is all to do with making sure that our internal conditions are suitable to make sure that our metabolism works to the best of its ability. OK, we know that metabolism or enzymes operate within a very narrow range of temperature and pH. So it's really important that we maintain that narrow range of temperature and pH inside of the body so that our enzymes can work effectively. How do we do that? Well, we have something called a homeostatic control. Homeostatic control is the idea that homeostasis uses negative feedback mechanisms to bring things back, conditions back to their normal. OK, things that we're going to look at then. So if you're doing triple science, you will look at the kidneys and you will see how the kidneys maintain water conditions. We're going to look today at temperature regulation. Uh, in the last series, we looked at glucose or sugar regulation, and those videos can be found on the Carlin Cymru website from last March. And uh, the body wants to maintain pH and carbon dioxide. And the reason for this is because of this graph. This is an enzyme graph. You probably recognize this from year 10. OK, so in year 10, you looked at enzymes. And one of the things that you looked at was the fact that enzymes work within a very narrow range. You can see there that blue dotty line that we've got running through the center that our enzymes have an optimal temperature, which means that they work best at 37 degrees. As soon as we move away from 30 to 7 degrees, so if the internal temperature was to decrease or if the internal temperature was going to increase, we can see that the rate of reaction, so those metabolism uh, reactions that we talk about in terms of respiration and any digestion and those things that happen in our body uh, don't happen as effectively. So it's important that our body maintains a temperature of 37 degrees. 37 degrees so our enzymes work at the best rate possible. OK, so let's think about a definition for negative feedback. If you're doing a higher tier paper, you need to make sure that that definition is learned off by heart. If you are doing foundation paper, I would say an understanding of negative feedback is going to be required. OK, so negative feedback is a change from the balance in optimal, optimal, sorry, internal conditions. So, for example, if we were talking about temperature regulations, we're talking about that optimal internal condition being 37 degrees. We're talking about a change from that. So if we see a decrease in body temperature or an increase in body temperature, that is a change from our internal conditions. Now, when our internal conditions change, then our body's hormonal response or nervous response, which we're going to look at next week, they try and restore the balance. So they try and bring it back to normal again. So if the temperature, for example, increases, so if our temperature rises, if our temperature goes above 37 degrees, then our negative feedback system comes into place to try and bring it back down again. OK, so things happen in our body to try and bring the temperature back down to 37 degrees. 
In the same respect, if our temperature drops, so if we're cold and our temperature falls below 37 degrees, then our negative feedback system comes back again to bring it back to temperature again. So let's look at that as a flow map. So we start off with optimal temperature, optimal conditions inside the body. OK, from there, then we have some sort of change. So let's say that our temperature increases. The change then is detected by a receptor in our body. A corrective mechanism is put into place. The conditions go back to where they were to start with. And then the corrective mechanism is then switched off once we get back to 37 degrees again. So today, even though negative feedback happens for lots of things, water regulation, temperature regulation, glucose regulation, we are focusing primarily on temperature regulation today. The first thing that we're going to look at, and this is relevant for both foundation tier and higher tier, is we're going to look at the structure of the skin. This is a cross section through the skin with the pink section at the top here being the outer edge of our skin. OK, so the pink section here is the outer bit of our skin, which you can see hairs coming out of the top. OK, when you see a diagram, I'll talk you through some past paper questions in a second. The skin is always at the top. OK, so the skin will always be at the top of the diagram and you will notice that because it's the bit where the hairs are coming out of the top. OK, so let's look at one side of the skin to start with. So the first thing that we're going to focus on then is this blue squiggle. That's what I always look for. That's what I always tell my students to look for on the diagram. This blue squiggle at the bottom here, even if it's a black and white photo, you're looking for a little squiggle at the bottom. That is the sweat gland. The sweat gland is where sweat is produced in the skin. Now you can see the sweat glands are not actually on the surface of the skin. The sweat glands are below the surface of the skin. And then we have what we call a sweat duct which sends sweat up to the surface of the skin. We can see there that sweat is starting to accumulate on top of the skin. And it will leave the skin then through a sweat pore. OK, so there are four labels to do with sweat. The big ones that you tend to be asked in the exam is the sweat gland. OK, so the sweat gland is that little squiggle at the bottom. OK, and then the sweat is trans transported through the sweat duct out of the sweat, the sweat pore, and then it will accumulate on the, on, on the skin. OK, and then it will evaporate. OK, let's look at the other side then. So we have these red and blue uh, vessels that you can see. These are our blood capillaries and our blood capillaries run quite close to the surface of our skin. We have, if we can see here, this red section, OK, because it's a cross section here. This is called the hair erector muscle. This is a muscle. Muscles do one of two things. They either contract or they relax. OK, and the job of the hair erector muscle is to either make your hair stand up straight or to allow your hairs to um, lie flat against your skin. So if you think about when you're cold, OK, your hair stands up, you get those goose pimples, OK, which is actually the hair standing up. OK, and that's because the hair erector muscle has contracted and it's forced the hair to actually stand up on edge, which means that that brown section then is the hair itself. And we know it's the hair because it's the bit that penetrates out through the skin. So this is something that you'd have to practice. OK, and obviously this PowerPoint will be available to you after the session. So you can always go away and have a go at doing this and quizzing yourself um, at a later date. So let's have a look what this would look like in an exam. So those two diagrams now look very different. And this is what students do struggle with is how am I going to look at this diagram and then compare it to this? Well, this is a similar diagram as you will see in other past paper questions. OK, it will be a two dimensional diagram in most cases. Most of the past paper questions that you see are two dimensional. And it asks you here in this past paper question, it says there's a section through the skin and it wants you to label A and B. Now, the one thing that you look at is this is always the surface of the skin. OK, so this is the bit that's exposed to the air. OK, and we can see here that we've got something penetrating through the surface of the skin. So A, A sorry, is the hair. OK, so when you look at the skin, you are looking for what penetrates the skin. That is the hair. OK, 
At the bottom then, you can see they're focusing on this squiggle. OK, and as I said, the squiggle that we're looking for then is the sweat gland. OK, and we know it's the sweat gland because we can see the sweat duct running right up through and then we can see the sweat pore then that would release sweat onto the surface of the skin. OK. Could another past paper question then? So if we have a look between that one and the previous one, these were two different years, two different past papers. The diagram is pretty much the same. OK, if we have a look like for like, it pretty much is the same diagram. So once you've seen one and you can label this, this is what I would actually use to label and practice at home, then you should be able to answer and label um, any past paper question. So if we look at the labels that we had before, so we can see the squiggle, this squiggle is the sweat gland and we can see the sweat duct that runs all the way up to the sweat pore. OK, and then onto the surface of the skin. OK, we can also see the hair that's penetrating the surface of the skin. And then we can see these blood capillaries, look, that are running along the, um, the surface. OK, so in this question, it says on the diagram, use arrows to label the one sweat gland. OK, so this is the sweat gland here. So you would draw an arrow and you would label it as sweat gland. And then the other one asks you to identify the erector muscle. Now, the erector muscle is responsible for uh, contracting and moving that hair up to stand on edge. So it's got to be connected to the hair. So as long as you can identify where the hair is, remember that's the bit that penetrates out through the skin, then you can identify where the erector muscle is. The erector muscle is joined to the hair. I'm colouring it in now in yellow. OK, so it's joined to the hair and that's responsible for contracting and allowing it to stand on edge. OK, so here is the erector muscle. OK, so if you're talking about a foundation question, these are the types of questions that would be to do with labelling the skin. OK, so let's focus now on what happens if your body increases in temperature. So we're talking about now a negative feedback whereby your body wants to do something to bring the temperature back down to 37 degrees. And as we can see here, a picture that I found off the internet, we can see some obvious features of what happens to us when we increase our body temperature. Number one, our sweat glands release more sweat. OK, so when we are hot, when our body temperature goes over 37 degrees, our sweat glands release more sweat. The blood vessels dilate and we're going to talk about what dilation means. OK, it means to get wider. OK, if we think about when the eye, the pupil of the eye dilates, we're talking about it getting wider. So the fact that our pupils dilate or get wider is what's causing this guy to look red. OK, he looks red because the blood vessels close to the skin have dilated. And the hairs on the skin lie flat. OK, so there are three things that our body does when our body increases in temperature. We're going to focus now on each one of those in turn and we're going to link it back to the ideas of how that happens, how that actually ends up cooling us down. So the first one is sweating. So here we've got a cross section again through the skin and we can see here the hairs there. We can see the squiggle of the sweat gland. We can see the sweat duct and we can see the sweat accumulating on the surface of the skin. So when we sweat, uh, when we're hot, we release more sweat from the body. Now, because sweat starts to form a layer on your skin, it will evaporate from the skin into the air around us. OK, so when we sweat, we don't stay sweaty forever. OK, so when we sweat, even if we don't wipe our face and we don't wipe the sweat off, eventually the sweat disappears and it hasn't disappeared. It has evaporated off the skin. When it evaporates off the skin, what it will do is as it evaporates, it will remove heat energy with it. So as it evaporates off the skin, it removes heat energy from the skin. And that's what results the temperature then decreasing back down to 37 degrees. OK, so when we sweat, this would be, for example, a model answer for how sweating helps cool us down. Sweat glands release more sweat 
try not just to say they sweat, OK? They release more sweat than when you're colder. The sweat evaporates from the skin and the evaporation of the sweat removes heat energy as it does it. OK, so these are the three steps that you would have to include in your model answer. OK, the next one that we're going to look at then is something called vasodilation. This is where our blood vessels that run close to our skin get wider. The word dilation or dilate means to become wider. We know that there are blood capillaries close to the skin surface. So if they were to become wider, OK, or dilate, you can use either of those terms. They dilate or become wider. You can't say thicker, you can't say longer, OK, because that's not true. They are becoming wider. Think about what you learnt in year 10 in terms of capillaries. They will increase their diameter. They become wider, which means that more blood can flow closer to the skin. So if they become wider, more blood can flow closer to the skin, and which means that more heat energy is lost to the atmosphere by radiation. So the heat energy will leave the blood, it will travel through the skin by the process of radiation. So this is a process called vasodilation, dilation meaning getting wider. As the blood capillaries get wider, more blood can flow closer to the skin, which means more heat energy is lost by radiation. OK. <clears throat> OK, the next one we're going to look at. Is our hairs. OK, so the important thing when we're hot, the hairs on the skin lay flat. When they're standing, OK, which is not true for when we're hot, when they're standing, they trap a layer of air in between it and that acts as an insulator. If they're lying flat, they're going to trap less air, OK? So less air will be trapped if they are lying flat. If they are lying flat, less air um, is trapped, which reduces the insulating layer. Air is a very good insulator because the particles are further away from each other. And when they're lying flat, there is less air trapped, which means that there is a less of an insulating layer. Because there's less of an insulating layer, this increases heat loss, meaning less heat energy is trapped inside the skin and more heat energy can be lost from it. So when the hairs lie flat, less air is trapped, which reduces the insulating layer, which then in turn increases heat loss. So these answers can be two marks or three marks, depending on the past paper question. There's quite a lot that you have to learn, but these three that we've just covered now are the model answers that we would expect you to learn for the GCSE. So let's go over that again. The body temperature increases, thermoregulatory centre detects a change, cooling responses activated, for example, sweating, temperature is reduced, and then the cooling response is switched off, for example, you stop sweating. This is the example of the negative feedback. Okay, this was the negative feedback of what happens if your body temperature increases. Okay, let's look at what happens if you have a decrease in body temperature. OK, so we talk about the sweat glands like we did before, but this time they release less sweat. OK. The blood vessels constrict. Now think about where we've heard that word constrict, like a boa constrictor, like a snake. OK, constrict means to get narrower. OK, constrict means narrow. It's the opposite to dilate. Dilate means get wider. Constrict means get narrower. So this time the blood vessels constrict. And the hairs on our skin stand up. OK, so when we're cold, we our hairs stand up on edge. It looks like we've got these goose pimples that we call them, okay, which is actually your hairs standing up on end. And you begin to shiver. So we're going to look at the mechanisms involved in each one of these now. Number one, sweating. So we know that when we're cold, we sweat less. OK, because we sweat less, less heat energy is lost from the body because we haven't got that layer of sweat on our skin to evaporate off. Nice, easy one. 
OK, the next one is vasoconstriction. Now, this is to talking about the blood capillaries. That's the vaso bit. OK, and constriction or constrict means to become narrower. So when we're cold or when our body temperature decreases below the normal of 37 degrees, then our blood capillaries will become narrower. They constrict. That process is called vasoconstriction. Because that happens, less blood is the opposite of what happened in vasodilation. Less blood can flow to the skin, which means less heat energy is lost by radiation. OK, so you learn one, you learn vasodilation and then, you know, vasoconstriction is the opposite. When they dilate, when we're hot, more blood flows through, so more heat energy is lost due to radiation. When they constrict, when, they, when we're cold, less blood can flow through the skin, which means that less heat energy is lost by radiation. They are opposite. OK, let's look at our skin hairs. So this time, rather than the hairs lying flat, this time this, the skin hairs stand upright. OK, so they stand up. And the reason why they stand up is because the erector muscle contracts. Now, when a muscle contracts, it becomes fatter. Okay, it becomes shorter and it becomes fatter. And I'll talk you through a past paper question um, from a previous year where that knowledge had to be um, available. Okay, they were kind of testing your understanding about a muscle. So muscles, when they contract, they get shorter and they get fatter. We can see in this diagram that the erector muscle, which is this bit here that I'm colouring in now, this is the erector muscle. We can see that this erector muscle, it has contracted because it's got shorter and it's got fatter. And when the erector muscle contracts, that causes the hair to stand up. Now, why does the hair need to stand up? Because it traps a layer of air between the hairs. So between each of these hairs now would be a nice thick layer of air trapped between them. Now, the air trap between them has one job, and that is to insulate the body. We have a layer of insulating air now running along um, our skin that will then cause a decrease in heat loss. OK, which more of we have more heat energy then retained inside of us. So let's go through that again. The hair stand up because the erector muscles contract. That traps a layer of air between the hairs, which insulates the body and decreases heat loss. The last one that we're going to look at then is shivering. If we think about what happens when we shiver, our muscles contract over and over again. So this is a series of rapid muscle contractions. OK, your muscles contract and relax over and over again. When they do that, the muscles require respiration to take place. And we know that respiration is an exothermic reaction, which means it releases heat energy from the reaction itself. And that in turn um, will increase our body temperatures. So when we shiver, that rapid muscle contraction, contract, relax, contract, relax, requires respiration to take place, which is an exothermic reaction, which results in heat energy being re released sorry, from the reaction. OK. So there's our negative feedback then for what happens if temperature decreases. The thermoregulatory center detects change from temperature receptors. Heating response is activated, for example, we shiver. Temperature is increased, then heating responses are switched off and we stop shivering and body temperature decreases back to normal. OK. Here is a little table to kind of summarize what I've been over so far, OK? So here are, we've got to think about what it is we would write in each of the boxes. So have a little look. This is a nice revision tool for after the session. OK, obviously, if you're not watching this live, you have the luxury of pressing pause. OK, so that you could have a go at this in your own time. OK, so you would have a look at this and you would think about what you would write in each of these sections. OK, I've done a summary this time. OK, a summary just to recap what would happen, um, just the basic understanding. So let's have a look at blood capillaries. So our blood capillaries, when we're too hot, they dilate. Remember, dilate means to get wider. Our sweat glands release more sweat or they release sweat and our skin hairs lie flat. Okay, so remember this is just a summary, 
OK, you would have to have an answer that was a lot more detailed that, like, than this for the exam, but this is good for recall. OK, so when we're too cold, then a blood capillaries constrict or they get narrower. The sweat glands stop sweating, so they stop produce sweat, uh, produce sweat or they produce less sweat and our skin hairs are erect or they stand up. OK, so this is a really good task to just double check whether you understand what happens to each of these things when we're too hot or when temperature goes above 37 degrees or when we're too cold and temperature decreases. OK, again, three questions to have a little think about. Why is it important that our body temperature does not rise too far above 37 degrees? Which part of the brain controls temperature regulation? And describe two ways the body can cool itself down and two ways it can keep itself warm. Again, if you're watching this um, after the live event, then you can pause the video at this point and you can have a look at these questions. Okay, so we maintain 37 degrees because uh, we don't want our enzymes to become denatured. We want them to work at their optimum performance. The part of the brain that controls temperature regulation is called the hypothalamus or the thermoregulatory center. And then the two ways the body can cool itself down would be vasodilation or the blood vessels uh, becoming wider, um, flap hairs or sweating, and then if we're too warm, we have vasoconstriction. So the ideas of the blood capillaries then get narrower. Our hair stands up or we have erect hairs and we stop sweating or we shiver. So any of those would be fine. OK, another little task that you can have a go at home. OK, so this is just to fill in the gaps. OK, this would kind of be a model answer for maybe a four mark question about blood capillaries. If they wanted you to talk about blood capillaries uh, when we are too hot or when we're too cold, this would be a really good example then. And again, you can have a go at home to practice what would be missing here. OK, so I'm just going to fill in the marks so that you can mark it then later on after the session. The reason why I've just rushed through that is I want to show you some of the past paper questions that have been there before. OK, so we can see here that we've got um, a picture. It's not a full cross section this time of um, of the skin. And we can see here that we're focusing primarily on just the hair, uh, the skin surface, and then it wants you look to label X. OK, so remember X, the only way that the hair is going to stand up on end is if a muscle contracts. So this is the hair erector muscle or just the erector muscle. OK, so that's what you would fill in for one mark there. Question part two says complete the diagram below by drawing in the position of the hair on a cold day. Now it's got cold in bold there. OK, so they've obviously drawn one already, so you know what the hair is kind of got to look like. OK, but this time you can see that the muscle itself the muscle itself is fatter than it was before. And because the muscle is fatter, that means that it has contracted. <coughs> if it's contracted, the hair in this case then would stand up. OK. Have a look at this question then. So it says diagrams A and B below show the skin under two different environmental conditions. So A, which of the diagrams show the skin in hot conditions? So that would be A, because you can see sweat coming out on the skin. <coughs> and question two then says, give two reasons for your answer. So you could say one of the reasons is because the hairs are lying flat. And then the second reason is that there's sweat on the surface of the skin. Okay, here's another question. Sorry, <coughs> it says the diagram below shows the hairs on the surface of the skin of a cat at different air temperatures. So we've got 6.4 degrees, so quite cold, and then we've got 22.7 degrees. This time they've just shown the surface of the skin and what's happening to the hairs. And we can see in diagram B it's the same. So it says name the structures in the skin that raise each hair. So that would be the erector muscle and then part B. <coughs> these would be the answers. Sorry about this. <coughs> OK, 
OK, have a look at little look at this question. <coughs> it says the graph shows the body temperature of a player during the course of a rugby match. State two responses made by the skin to cause the change in body temperature. This time observe between 340, which is here, and 410. Have a little think what you'd write there. I'll just get myself a glass of water. Okay, so state two responses made by the skin. So we can see during that time, the body temperature has decreased. So we're saying what responses in the skin caused the change, caused the change. So let's have a look at the mark scheme. <laughs> we can see sweating would have caused the change in temperature. So sweating could have caused the body temperature to come down. Vasodilation or blood vessels widening. That could have caused the decrease in temperature and hairs lying flat or hairs lying down or hairs lowered. That also could have caused the decrease in temperature. OK. Have a look at this graph here and you can see that we've got the normal. This is 37 degrees. This is showing a negative feedback mechanism. We can see that if the body temperature increases, we can see if body temperature increase, the temperature receptors in the brain detect a change in temperature. That would then cause a corrective mechanism to come into play. So this is sweating, vasodilation or hairs lying flat. On the other side then we've got a decrease in body temperature this would cause a change in temperature and then we have corrective mechanisms to come back into place again have a look at this flow map <coughs> which focuses on the same so does this one okay Last thing I want to cover is this question here. So this is a QER or a six mark question. This one is explaining how human skin helps to control body temperature in hot conditions. So I just want to give you a couple of minutes now to have a look. What would you write down to the bullet point? What you would write down for this question? Give you a couple of minutes OK, to give you an idea of that one and then we're going to go through the answer. OK, obviously, if you're not watching this live, then you can pause the video at this point. What I'd like to do is just go through the answers now. What are you going to talk about? Now, it says use the features labelled on the diagram below. OK, use the features labelled on the diagram. So we're expecting you to talk about the hair <coughs> and the erector muscle. They're expecting you to talk about the sweat gland and the sweat duct and the sweat pore, and they're expecting you to talk about the blood vessels. So let's have a look what you'd have to write for six marks for this question. Okay. So you can see here, this is the mark scheme that was from the GCSE paper. So under warm conditions, the erector muscle relaxes. Remember, muscles can do one of two things. They can contract or they can relax. In this case, because the hair is lying flat, OK, because the hair is lying flat, 
the muscle must be in its relaxed position. Because the hair lies flat, that means less air is going to be trapped between the hairs, which means it reduces the insulation from the air itself. OK, so that's the three marks there that you would have to talk about in order to fully um, achieve the marks for the hairs. The next one then is the blood vessels. OK, so the blood vessels and these are the options they give you. Look, widens, so it becomes wider, dilates, <clears throat> which means the same thing, or vasodilates, OK, which means the same thing again. Because the blood vessel gets wider, this bit is um, needed more blood. Don't just say blood flows through because obviously blood flows through all of our vessels. More blood flows through towards the skin, which means that more heat is lost. And I would probably add in there by radiation. OK, the last one then we've got sweat this time. So remember it's all to do with a bit being hot more sweat is produced. Can you see how more is underlined? It's not just sweat is produced. I would always say more sweat is produced. OK, so when we're hot, more sweat is produced because the gland still produces sweat, but more is produced if we are hot. So that then goes on to the surface of the skin or out of the sweat pore. So you were allowed either of those. And then the last mark then was for that evaporation, which then removes heat. Now it says because uh, QERs are marked on a band system, so in top band, you're five to six marks, you must have reference to all three structures. If you, if you, only, if you only talked about sweat, and blood vessels, then you're not going to have the full marks for that question. OK, so it's really important that you make sure that you are focusing on all three sections um, of the skin in order to make sure that you're going to get full marks for that question. OK, right, because we've got a little bit more time because I've gone through that a little bit quick. Um, I'm just going to go back to this question here. <clears throat> you can do these offline when you're ready in your own time as well. So Dylan set up an experiment to study negative feedback mechanisms associated with the rapid cooling of the hand. A temperature sensor was held between the fingertips, OK, which is here. OK, so a temperature sensor was held between the fingertips of a volunteer and another sensor was taped to the skin on the upper chest. OK, <clears throat> the sensors were connected to a data logger, which is here. And it was recorded for three minutes. And obviously this is the graph. I've kind of cut it and put it all on one page. This is the graph that came from the data logger. OK, so we've got sensor A in black. OK, so the one he's holding in his fingertips is sensor A. OK, and sensor B is the one on his chest. OK, it says the volunteer placed their right hand into ice cold water 30 seconds after the recording started. OK, so 30 seconds after the hand was then removed from the ice cold water after a further 30 seconds. So now we can start thinking about what this graph is showing. If we have a little look down, there is a change at this point. I'll try and draw a straight line. OK, and that is the 30 second mark. OK, so we can see that at 30 seconds, there is a definite change in the recordings from the sensor. And then if we move on, OK, uh, he removed it from the ice cold water a further se 30 seconds after that. OK, so around 60 seconds. So I guess that would be kind of over that area there. OK, so let's look at what the question is asking. OK, so the first question then is state what is meant by a negative feedback mechanism. State what is meant by a negative feedback mechanism. This is a higher tier question. So because it's a higher tier question, they are expecting you to be able to recall the answer. This is a two mark question. OK, so let's have a look what they were expecting for two marks. So for one mark, you had to say that a negative feedback is a change from normal internal conditions. OK, so it's a change from the normal. So remember when we're talking about temperature, we are changing from 37 degrees. OK, because they don't ask specifically what negative feedback mechanism is for temperature regulation, make sure that your definition is 
is vague in that respect. Don't talk about temperature, don't talk about glucose, okay? So a change from normal, that would get you one mark. The second mark then is resulting in the body, responding and restore, restoring normal conditions. So remember when our temperature increases, our body does something about it, okay? We um, sweat and we um, our blood vessels um, dilate which then responds and then restores back the normal conditions. So if you're looking for a definition to learn, this is the one that came from the WJC Mark scheme. So this would be a really good one just to kind of put on a flashcard and practice if you're doing higher tier. The next question then said, describe the results for sensor A after the hand was placed in cold ice water. So describe the results of sensor A. So number one, we had to remind ourselves which one is sensor A. OK, so the black is sensor A and they want us to talk about what happens after 30 seconds. OK, and we can see here after 30 seconds. Look what's happening. OK. It is decreasing. The temperature is decreasing. OK, so obviously this would all be on one page. So you would look across to the graph and you would have a look at the plat pattern. Look where 30 minutes, uh, 30 seconds are and find out what the pattern is showing. The last one then says explain the change in temperature recorded by sensor A between 30 seconds and 90 seconds. So this time 90 is around here. OK, this point here where I'm drawing a line down now. They want you to explain. So what's the science? What's the science involved? So we can see that there is a temperature decrease. And it's saying explain the, temp the change in temperature recorded by sensor A between 30 and 90. OK, so <clears throat> first thing that would happen is that detectors in the body would detect a drop in temperature. OK, so as we put a hand in the cold water, there are detectors in our body, in our brain. The thermoregulatory centre would then say that there's a drop, drop in temperature as a result the blood vessels would get narrower or they would constrict or they would, you know, vasoconstriction would take place. That would get you the second mark. The third mark would come from the idea that blood flows to the skin. Let, oh, I've missed a word there. If you think about what word I've missed, less. I've missed the word less there. Less blood flows to the skin. OK, so that's the idea of the answer being right or wrong there, less blood flows to the skin. And then as a result, less heat is lost. OK, so here we've got a specific example. This is why it's a higher tier. They put it into context. It's moving away from just recall and we're having to apply our knowledge then to an actual situation. OK, there's other questions in this PowerPoint that you are free to look at when you've got time. OK, the other thing I just wanted to lend you to, if we've got three minutes now before the end of the session, is just the additional revision resources. OK, there are great resources out there now. OK, the WJC have put together some blended learning resources, which you can click on the link when the PowerPoint becomes available to you. This sends you to the WJC website for biology, but they've got ones for biology and chemistry and physics and other GCSE um, qualifications as well. And they are interactive resources, so you get to revise and you get to do past paper questions and you get to do a little quiz in there. OK, they're great for um, revision. So if you finish this session, and you want to do something in addition to it, then that's a great place to start is the WJC blended learning resources. The other one that I found quite useful with my classes, it's called Physics and Maths Tutor. OK, they do one specific to the WJC and they give you flashcards and they give you um, past paper question packs with the mark schemes with them as well. They give you um, keyword definition glossaries and um, there's a whole host of revision resources there. Um, I've clicked on the link. It will send you to a page that looks like it's got hundreds of resources. You just pick the topic that you are revising for today and hopefully um, you will pick something that is useful to you. Sorry about the coffin today. <laughs> um, it's a little bit hot in my room and uh, uh, taking my um, taking my uh, my voice a little bit. Um, but I hope you've got something out of today. The resources will be available on the Carlham Cymru website after this session, and um, hopefully we will see you next week without any teething problems and with definitely a drink of water in hand. Okay, thank you everyone. Bye.